team ever assembled in the history of team sports. So I was listening recently to this amazing podcast uh, about the 1992 Dream Team, and you know, it got me thinking. You know, in 1992, it was not only just this extraordinary basketball team that just dominated the Olympics in Barcelona, but um, you know, at the time, there were just a handful of international players in the NBA, which of course is the premier league in, in in the world. And then you fast forward to now, and they're probably about a quarter of the players, I think, maybe even more um, in the NBA now are, are international players here on the Toronto Raptors. We have many players who are not born um, uh, in the U.S. You know, you look at a moment in 92 where things are just budding. Why did that happen then? Like, what was it about that moment that really globalized basketball? I think, for one, it was the coming together of all those superstars yeah. and seeing them on the same team. Yeah. It was so important for that team to bring together Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and Michael Jordan. Yeah. Right? And if you watch the documentaries, the back and forth in terms of getting yeah, they didn't them really together. Like each other at first, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So trying to make that happen, um, and then you knew what was going to happen once they were on the court. Yeah. But to see it was just a different thing. And yeah. for me, I remember, you know, I didn't see that team play, right. but you heard all the stories yeah. and that's part of why you know even though bas like the NBA wasn't that accessible growing up in Dubai yeah when Space Jam came out I was like I have to see it right 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 I, I wasn't watching the NBA or anything like that yeah. but when that came out it was like oh this is Michael Jordan you have to see it right so it almost became like a cultural phenomenon yeah in many ways yeah well and and more than international player development more than a cultural phenomenon it led to an explosion of the NBA's business internationally yeah. Adam Silver would say the single greatest thing that had an impact on the internationalization of the NBA's business was the dream team yeah. playing in Barcelona in 1992 without yeah. question when we were watching in 1992 we were we were watching as closely to the US beating Angola by like 60 points as we were like you know between what was the conversation like between Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson? And where was Larry Bird fitting into all of this? And you know, how much trouble was uh, Charles Barkley going to get into when he was in Spain and so on? Yeah. So like, people were, like, they were following these individual players. Like, they're iconic people as well. And so, Actually, let me, let me take you back to uh, when you graduated from college. And um, soon thereafter, you went off to England, right? Yeah. To play in Derby. You know, when you look back at like maybe pivotal experiences in your life that yeah. really changed your life. Yeah. Like me, me getting on that plane and going to Derby because <laughs> I'd been raised and educated and grown and lived all my, every second in Iowa. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I'm I'm in Europe and I'm in England and I'm that really transformed me just in a lot of ways. And I think that's really just helped me be able to, you know, coach a team of international yeah. people. So one of the things that um, during the 2019 run, right, um, the Jurassic Park, like I'm gonna say plural, <laughs> yeah. um, was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, part of the whole thinking behind this show was around, you know, this sort of global community yeah. in this, just tightly packed space and I was walking around it's like people of all different color and uh, you know it's, it's just all the ages like there's a sort of community uh, that the Raptors yeah. have been able to create and I don't think that you see that everywhere my biggest takeaway from the parade right was when I got done I just I had this like pickup truck I was riding in the back of yeah so I was kind of up in the air standing and and I just could not believe the smiling faces yeah. of the young kids of every color yeah. from all over the world, yeah. constantly along that parade route. I just, that was my you, you, first, That was what yes, you were thinking? that was my, when I like got up the next day, like that's what I was thinking of how amazing that was to see 
the whole world there. Yeah. This is kind of from an outsider coming to Toronto. It yeah. feels that way when you yeah. come here. Yeah. Right? You know, when I first get here and I'm an assistant and I'm taking the streetcar to games yeah. and, and you look in the streetcar and the whole world's in the streetcar yeah. and everybody's, you know, saying good luck coach and yeah, you yeah. know all this stuff and you know what I, you know <laughs> yeah. and yeah. and um I don't know, it just feels like it's um part of the city. I remember when NBA.com kind of first got started and going to that website and trying to get as much content as I could because I couldn't access the games because of the time difference and the fact that I didn't even have the channel, right? Mm -hmm. And so going there to get that. And now if you look at it, the strategy is literally let's put this in as many people's hands as possible. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain kind of mindset to say, actually, we want to, demo you know, use the term, democratize the sport. We want to open it up. We want to make this available to everyone and where everyone can feel like they belong. That goes against a lot of the kind of, you know, navel gazing, you know, closing borders, closing boundaries type of impulses that we see now. So is that... Is that something that's really distinctive and unique to basketball where we, or at least the, how the league has evolved and how the sport has evolved, where there's a real open mindset as opposed to one that's a little bit more closed that we see in other sports? It's not expensive compared to other sports. Mm -hmm. so, more accessible. Yeah, exactly. Much more expensive, uh, accessible. Just because you need a basketball and a rim, and if you really you know, want to train yourself, um, you could find a way to, you know, practice, mm -hmm. maybe not the shooting, but like you could find other ways to actually work on the development of your skill, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel like it, it's accessible for sure. We always used to joke that it was, and it wasn't just that, even just the notion of basketball was accessible. If there was a, you know, garbage pail in the room, you'd, you'd scrunch up a piece of paper and, and right. take shots and do it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's sort of the magic of the game. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, going to a game at Scotiabank Arena is not accessible. You know, yeah. that's an expensive proposition. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what dovetails with the idea that let's make sure this content, though, can get out there to as many people. Yeah. That's what this is really about. Um, and, and that's been intentional, unique, I think, to basketball and to the NBA. And, and the idea of, like, we're going to do everything we can do to get NBA.com and our app really popular, but we're going to do it by promoting Steph Curry's own Instagram page and right. LeBron's right to have social media platforms as opposed to, you know, competing against them. Mm -hmm. and I think that was very intentional mm. um, from the start. One of the um, effects of the 92 Dream Team was was the realization of the extraordinary commercial benefits that, um, uh, that could be realized by globalizing the sport. Do you find it's ever at odds, the commercial, the commercial drive, the commercial interest versus some of, the other, um, some of the other concerns that we might have with respect to sport or some of the other benefits that could come from sport? Oh, frequently. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to, you know, and, I, and I'm off, I've been involved for a good portion of my career in working in sport, promoting sport, you trying to use the power of sport to transform communities, yeah. not just Canadian communities, but Chinese communities yeah. for a good portion of my career. When I was in tennis, it, we were trying to transform communities, sometimes in the Middle East and Qatar. Yeah. I like to find the sweet spot where those two things tend to connect mm -hmm. rather than when they're in tension. From an economic standpoint, I think I agree. I think there's it's such a fine line between capitalistic gains versus betterment of the sport. The way I like to see it is that it's net positive if you're thinking economic first. I mean, if we have more money from where I sit, um, there's more players who are getting an opportunity to play professional basketball. If there's more money, there's more people going out there and experiencing joy and happiness by watching a basketball game. But it goes back to intent and purpose. Like, it always goes back to intent and purpose. So as a storyteller, I will find that net positive and try and tell it as best as I can. And mm -hmm. I think the growth should never be restricted. Of course, keep intent and purpose in mind where it's not just about the bank balance, mm -hmm. that's all. Try to pick up your pace a little bit going the other way, especially after a turnover. We got wide open shots all over the place. Okay, it's time to step up and start making them. Here we go. Oh, let's go red. So I wanted to talk about your PhD dissertation. I know a little bit about it and it's around, it's around leadership, right? And it's around impact and the yeah. impact that athletes can have and so forth, right? What prompted you to, like, what got you to think about that? Because I think about my students all the time. I mean, you got players, I got students. Yeah. I'm always thinking about how can these students 
have an impact. Where did the drive come from for you? Same. I almost ask, ask it a little bit differently and how can I impact what they're doing, right? Yeah. What, what, you know, other than the coaching, I mean, we're going to, we're going to pour our, our hearts and soul into making them better basketball players and helping their careers, right? Yeah. We just talked about it this morning, yeah. right? Like we, we talk about winning for the team and doing what's right for the team and then how that affects their value in the marketplace, right? Right. So right. that's, that's, and, and what happened is, is probably again, just a lot of interesting timing. Yeah. I'm going through this thing. I'm doing papers. I'm now become head coach. And I start thinking about, I want to have my own foundation because I've been given this great platform. Yeah. And this is something I can research, yeah. learn about, do, yeah. and then be able to help the players when they're ready to do this kind of stuff. And that's really what happened. I was kind of right at the, trying to figure out to start my own. I started doing some papers and research on it and it yeah. just led to like really early on, I knew this was what I was going to do for my dissertation yeah. because I was just going to study that and then be able to pass on and help the players when they, when they wanted to give back in their communities and make an impact that I would have the experience and maybe some knowledge yeah. um, to pass along to them. I was listening to uh, Shereen Ahmed, who was also a guest in Joe's Basketball Diaries. And, you know, one of the things that she was stressing in another interview was the lack of investment, for instance, with respect to uh, the WNBA and women's basketball, right? And that, you know, there's this terrific product there. There's uh, not only a terrific basketball product, but, you know, uh, really of the sort of social conscience of, of, of society right now in terms of Black Lives Matter, uh, Brittany Griner. Um, there are a lot, I mean, they really are at the forefront as a league of so many different things. And it's puzzling to her, it's puzzling to me, why more investments aren't being made in what is an, a terrific set of stories, right, that could yeah. be told. I think, yeah, it's definitely sad that the, I guess, women's sport is not getting as much attention um, from a very standpoint. And I feel like, uh, I know NBA has recent, like, I don't think it's been too many years yet, but they've kind of started to um, align their logo with the WNBA when putting their, um, uh, like, a big announcements out mm -hmm. and even when partnering with uh, different sponsors. So I feel like that's kind of getting... Um, different people that haven't been aware of the WNBA to actually recognize this as an as an as a professional league and even inv invest in it and um, seeing uh, male NBA players uh, attend WNBA games and just being there and advocating for even Bernie Griner I feel like it is very important for the males in, in the NBA to actually I guess use their platform as much as they can to advocate for women's sport because it's not just a WNBA but like all all around like women's sport is not getting the attention that it deserves. So as you're building now the uh, the Muslim Women's Summer Basketball League yeah. here in Toronto, right. right? Right, right. I mean, what are some of the challenges that you face but also as you've just described what are some potential opportunities? I feel like alignment when partnering with different organizations that aligns with what we're trying to do with basketball uh, for women's sport and just uh, women uh, you know, empowerment has been such a big deal uh, in terms of the economics aspect. Yeah. But um, the, I guess, challenges has been finding space. Uh, it has been an uh, issue just because uh, I feel like for so long, uh, women of color or specifically Muslim women have been left out from these spaces. And when they come, finally come to these spaces and say, hey, like, uh, is it possible for me to even maybe get a, a prayer room when this time arrives, you know. Mm -hmm. For example, when they say women only spaces, is it really women only spaces? Because I've even experienced it where, um, you know, a, a male would come by to do something, but now nah, I took my hijab off. So it kind of, you know, took away the whole privacy aspect that was granted in the first place. So I feel like access to um, from a, a space has been a challenge. Um, but luckily, again, uh, just being in the city of Toronto and just how people were willing to accommodate and understand mm. and willing to learn has been such a big uh, part of just the league growing and um, the, the attention is kind of, you know, getting. One thing that struck me over the summer was the women's uh, Euro Cup. Mm. And that wasn't accessible here in Canada. Mm. It wasn't 
available on TV, on TV anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you look at the numbers outside of Canada where it was being broadcast, they were huge. It was a huge success. Mm -hmm. uh, and England ended up winning it. And um, I think that is something where you have to be proactive uh, in recognizing these opportunities and just going for it. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, like when I was growing up, professional sport was not considered a place of economic opportunity. Like right. You didn't own a professional baseball team, for example because the franchise value was going to be worth a lot or because you're going to make a lot of profit. In fact, they lost money. And if you sold them, you tended to lose like, or get less than you paid for it. But lots of people, lots of men, made the, the non-economic decision to get involved in sport or get involved in sports content for whatever reason suited them. And I feel like to advance women's sport more, more people have that have deep pockets have to make non-economic decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know why that isn't happening. I, I mean, I think more cities should have WNBA teams. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was also thinking about in terms of the, the economics of, and the sort of globalized economics of sport, there is you know, more awareness around things like, as people have described it now, um, sport washing, right? That, um, that there is this uh, opportunity to leverage the human, the humanistic side of sport, to try to you know launder or to sport wash some of the more unsavory parts of, of societies here and and elsewhere. I think, for instance, of the World Cup in Qatar uh, and uh, the way in which, as many have pointed out, the just extraordinary um, human rights abuses as it relates to the construction workers, many of whom thousands have lost their lives in. Mm -hmm in putting on this very large international spectacle for the world to see, it's a real challenge to find that sweet spot, right, when you've got two diametrically opposed views. Let, let's put the Beijing 2022 Olympic Games on the table, because if, you know, somebody else should if I don't. Mm -hmm. um, the, the abhorrent treatment of Muslim Uyghurs mm -hmm. in Western China, um, in the Xinjiang region, is something that sort of got the world's attention that uh, many got asked, including myself repeatedly, well, what is Canada going to do about it? And we we're at, you know, some people pressured us to boycott the games. And it, I, when I spoke it's earlier, be tough, yeah. when I spoke earlier about I tend to err on the side of participation, um, it's it taken me a long time to land in that space, but but it, it comes down fundamentally to the fact that I think it's incredibly unfair to ask athletes mm. to solve problems that governments aren't themselves prepared to solve or, mm. or have been unable to. I get that. But athletes have extraordinary power as well. You know, LeBron James says something and the world listens, right? Um, even, even a GM like Daryl Morey. Right, with Houston, tweet something and the world is listening. In the Miami Heat, in the wake of the Trayvon Martin tragedy, and there's that famous photo of the hoodies up. Like, that was so powerful. That probably, that probably meant more in terms of its societal impact than anything any politician could say. Right? So while it is unfair to ask athletes to have to bear the burden of executing foreign policy, they have a lot of power. I feel like in terms of professional athletes, it's important to know that I don't think all, I feel yes, they are, you know, they have this beautiful opportunity to make millions of dollars, but not all of them are, are natural athlete activists. Because once they tweet out something, they have to literally be the expert in that thing. So every press conference, every, yeah. they have to. So I feel like that's why sometimes they're hesitant on like, oh, I don't want to associate myself with yeah. it. For example, Michael Jordan, you know, him not being, um, you know, in the last dance as, you know, he spoke about it, that he didn't want to be involved in politics, you know, during his time. And he's gotten so much criticism because of it. So athletes definitely know how much power they hold, but like, do they really want to do all that mm -hmm. because they're risking so much? Athletes, coaches, I mean, folks in, this, in, in, uh, in the sporting world have I mean, in one sense, they have a tremendous opportunity, right? I mean, there's just this amazing platform. Is this something they embrace? Is this something that's part of their DNA? They, they just see this as a responsibility? Or is this something that 
is coached. It's in something that's coachable and teachable. You know, I start every season with this kind of either this mural or this pyramid or this coliseum of, of our thoughts and ideas and our vision for the season. Yeah. One thing right at the top is being world leaders for cultural change. Wow. Right. So, okay. so, and then I show them, you know, I show them Freddie and I show them Masai yeah. and I show them myself and Pascal and, and, and OG and Scotty and all these guys out there doing stuff and just letting them know that like, if you want to do something, right. we're here to help you. And translating one's own personal experiences into activism takes a lot of courage, right? hundred percent. Yeah. To make that commitment, I think really does take um, some thought. And like yeah, for me, yeah. I, I think back to like, you know, you know, Bill Russell who just yeah. passed and you really stop and think about that. Wow. You think about him in that time in the United States. And in that town. In that town. Yeah. And that's one thing, like you said, like the students going out, it's one thing. Yeah. But then you're out on display yeah. constantly. It's, you know, can be dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. It is you know, house broken into. For and, sure. You yeah. know, so so it's like you're right. It does take a a huge level of commitment and a tremendous amount of courage. Back in the day, you know, sports journalists reported on the games, right? I mean, but now there is a there is a platform to have a much more activist voice, right? Just in terms of the content that you're producing now and your own writing as well, right? It's not just the game anymore, like the game last night, right? Yeah. But it's actually about capturing something bigger. No, there's no question. And I mean, you can't ignore it as well. Like I remember working at the Sportsnet desk when LeBron James called Donald Trump a bum. Right. What are you going to do, ignore that? Right. So we had to write about it and right. everything that comes along with that. And so you have to be prepared for this kind of stuff. Um, going back to the bubble, um, we were doing all the player interviews via Zoom. And uh, Rondé Hollis Jefferson, who was playing for the Raptors at the time, were asking them these personal questions um, and everything that was around the NBA's Black Lives Matter campaign. And he just stopped it for a second and said, hey, you know, you're getting all these quotes from us. We need to see your voice too. To the media. Yeah. You're saying this to the media. Mm. Hmm. Are you with us? You're covering us every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're making money off our backs. Are you going to stand with us too? And that was something that hit me mm -hmm. as well. And so I think we do have that responsibility in not just conveying what they're saying, but standing with them as well. I sometimes wonder is that I live in one of the most globally diverse multicultural cities in the world, right? And one of the things that I love about, for instance, being a fan of the Toronto Raptors is I'm in a taxi cab in Rwanda and the driver says, hey, you know, the Toronto Raptors, you know, there are all these African players there. And this was at a time when Serge Ibaka was on the team and Pascal was on the team. You know, there's a real kind of globalness to Toronto. And I do wonder sometimes if the rest of the world is actually like that, right? And so when I think about uh, and I read about the hijabi ballers, for instance, or the Muslim Women's Summer Basketball League, which is a real grassroots initiative here. Do you see these opportunities elsewhere, or is it really a Toronto phenomenon? Yeah, absolutely. I believe it's possible. It, it's already, we've gotten people reach out to us from around the world telling right. us that we love what we're doing in, in Toronto and we're actually doing something similar in these countries. So. Um, it has already reached, you know, other places, so uh, definitely possible. All right, I think so tell me, like, what, what are some of these other places? Uh, that, uh, someone from Philly, Philly is trying to do something similar. Yeah. Um, we've got someone from Norway, like, we didn't even know there's a big Muslim com community there. Yeah. Um, Australia, too. Like, we've, yeah, we've gotten different. And they're turning to you guys, yeah, like, like, turning to you, saying, yep. like, this is the model. Yeah. We are community first. It is yeah. grassroots yeah. to global. And I really think when we started in 2019, it was stemming from the fact that the Raptors had such a beautiful run. Um, the founders built it because we needed to put a lens on the fact that there are these Canadian pro ballers who some of them have gotten into the NBA and have kind of done some brilliant things. And some of them 
are playing in the U sports level, playing at the NCAA level, and then like 200 plus of them are playing professionally in Europe, why not let the Canadians know that there's more Canadians out there playing mm. professional basketball beyond just the Raptors or the NBA? That was the initial idea behind why this thing started, and boy did it take a, take a life of its own where our fifth season starts in 2023. 10, 11 teams now. Calgary just recently got launched. We're in Montreal, Calgary. Vancouver's got now its own team. Obviously, the Scarborough kind of taking over Toronto's team. As we look forward, the globalization of sport is here. But who's driving this, this bus forward? I don't think fans realize how powerful they are. Mm. You know, I'll give my 489th soccer example. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you go back uh, a couple years where uh, the big soccer clubs tried to bring in uh, the Super League yep. and sort of gatekeep this opportunity that the top teams were going to have. You saw protests everywhere. Mm. And immediately the idea was scrapped. Right. Because of the fans. Yeah. yeah. There were fan protests out, outside, outside of the stadiums. Uh, they absolutely were not having it because of what it would do to all the smaller clubs that are trying to compete. As it is, there's such a big margin to make up for in terms of the resources available to the big clubs. And now you create this other event that only the big clubs are really gonna have access to. And so to see those protests literally shut down that mm -hmm. idea, I think fans have a significant power that uh, you know, maybe on some level they don't realize as much in North America. Um, in terms of the power of sport, I kept switching hats during this entire time when I was listening to all of you. I'm switching, okay, I'm the fan now. Oh damn, I'm the business guy now. Okay, I'm the storyteller now. Okay, I may be an athlete, I could be an athlete. I really think it's the power of sport is so individual. Like it's so individual, we name LeBron James, we name Kobe Bryant, we name Masai Ujiri. These are individuals that have a certain intent and purpose, who don't think that I'm gonna claim sport, I'm gonna be the right. power, you know, I'm gonna be the superhero that's gonna do it all. I think they just do. And they do it with the intent of goodness, community, diversity, inclusion, access. And I really think that even fans, the fans don't know the power they have because we, I'm just liking a tweet from LeBron who said something profound. It's all I did, but that one like yeah. creates it's, business it's, decisions, it's a source right? Of power. Yeah. So for me, I go back to just internalizing, going within, and just understanding that my love for whatever sport, however I have it, is what drives this thing. And at the end of the day, that always wins.